when you don't understand what you're investing in or you're, it's not within your circle of competence, it can have an impact on you. Hey, Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Rob. Well, I really appreciate it. Um, got a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about real estate investing. We're going to talk about you know stock and index fund investing and business. But um, I want to start with some of your background so people kind of have an idea of, of, of who you are. And um, I just know from reading about you uh, that you were into motocross as a, as, a, as a younger. So you started at age four. Did I get that right? Is that even humanly possible? Yeah, I entered my first race at four. Uh, that must have been like awesome <laughs> as a yeah, four-year-old. My career was. Yeah. And you did that till you were 14. I think I think I saw you you said you were number two in your in, I guess your age in the world, right? Yes. Yep. And for a variety of reasons, you, you stopped at 14. There was you know some accidents, some deaths. Um, the economy was tough, it's expensive. So I've I've you know, there were a number of reasons you stopped at 14. And then you went into finance. Uh, that was sort of your study. You went to college. And there's a point to all of this. I'm getting to a, a, a question that I think can be helpful to a lot of people. But you fast forward to today, you're kind of, you're a business person, right? I mean, you you left the corporate world, I think earlier this year, right? Or end of last year, something like that. Yeah, in January of this year. And if, if I can ask, how old are you? I am 26. 26, right. So you've, you, you've done a heck of a lot more than I had when I was 26. So my question is, to do these things, you've got to be driven, right? People don't rise to the number two in the world in their sport, uh, you know, and then go to college. You got to, didn't you, did you get an MBA? Do I have that right as well? Yes. Yep. I did. Okay. I mean, you're obviously a very driven person. Why, why do you think that is? I think today I'm driven because of what I did in motocross when I was younger. When I was younger, I think it was just kind of innate in me. When I first started riding, I just kind of had a natural ability that kind of brought me to the top of the rankings. And so when you're doing well at something, you enjoy it typically. And I, I loved it more than anything. And so I continued to try and get better and better. And it was just kind of innate in me to get better as, as much as I could. And then I think because I've been doing that since I was essentially four, I mean, I really started taking racing seriously probably when I was like six, seven, eight, but for almost 10 years, it was something that I was just always driven at. And so I think being doing that at such a young age has transferred to where I am today. I think it's now just part of who I am. Do, do you think the fact that you're driven, has it influenced uh, family members or friends that you're close with who, I don't know, maybe weren't as driven, but because of you have become driven or do they just shake their head and think, okay, he's just a, in a different kind of league and and I'm going to go back to watching TV at night. So I think it's more the latter. I think typically people think I'm the black sheep. I'm considered usually like the black sheep of the family. And that's not to say that, you know, my family doesn't love me and I don't get along with them or that my I don't get along with my friends. But typically I'm seen as a little bit different than especially family, oftentimes friends. And to be completely frank, I've had a lot of relationships in my life mostly personal, not family that haven't worked out because I am the way I am and they were the way they were. And for me, it's been hard to have the drive that I do to continue to be friends or even have relationships with people who don't have that same drive. So yeah, I have typically been the black sheep of, of relationships, family, friends, things of that nature. That's an interesting observation because I, I think I'm driven too. Now, I wasn't driven to do the kinds of things you did when I was younger. But when I look at other people that aren't, they tend to focus more on relationships. Not that driven people don't focus on relationships, but driven people tend to focus on whatever is driving them at the moment, whether it's motocross or a real estate you know, empire or running a company. And those things tend to take us, uh, you know, relationships can sometimes take a back seat to all of that. And that can cause conflict. At least that's been the case in my experience. And so I'm always juggling that tension. Have you, have you found it to be similar? Yes and no. I think what's interesting is 
I've actually been driven by relationships. And I think I probably would have gone down a similar path to a lot of people like you alluded to in terms of relationships kind of falling by the wayside. But, and the reason I say that is because when I was younger and younger is, you know, early twenties, like 18 to early twenties, I only cared about money. Like that's all I cared about. I didn't, I was driven, but I was driven because of money. Mm -hmm. relationships. I just wanted to be a billionaire. That was like, I wanted private jets. I wanted mansions. I wanted all that kind of stuff. And I was even voted most likely to be a billionaire in my senior class of like superlatives. So like, it's just been very well known that like, that is my focus. And then I had my son at 22 or 23. So early in my, and when he was born, it really changed everything for me. Totally changed my philosophy on money, not in terms of like how I acquire it or view it, it was more about how I viewed it. And I didn't really care so much about being a billionaire billionaire anymore. I wanted to have the money for my own time sake. So I could have time freedom rather than just being a billionaire. And so from there, ever since I was like 22, 23, so for the last four or five years, I've really been driven by relationships because you know, for example, my son, I want to do X, Y, and Z in business. I want to buy rental properties, et cetera, so that I have passive income so that I can go to all of his baseball games. Or if he wants to race motocross, all of his races, you know, all of those types of things. My dad has probably been the biggest influence in my entire life. And my dad has always had this dream car that he wants. And so not that it's necessarily a relationship, a car for him. Or, you know, whatever the case is, there's different things in different relationships that I want to be able to do. And there are some important people in my life that I want to take care of. And so now I'm driven by wanting to do those things for those relationships, rather than my drive hindering those relationships. That's great. Kind of give us an overview of what you're doing from from a business perspective, but then your your investments, real estate, stocks, funds. What does that all look like for you right now? Yeah. So I'm doing a lot of different things. I'm doing some freelancing slash consulting for a podcast company. I'm doing my own podcasts. I'm investing in real estate, which includes a couple different things, rental properties, RV rentals. I am trying to build personal brands on social media, also uh, working on a real estate education platform and also working on a nonprofit. So those are all the different things I'm working on right now. So you're not very busy. No, not too busy. <laughs> so let's talk about the podcast briefly. And I'm, I know Stig, who's over at the Investors uh, Podcast Podcast Network. And I think two, is it two of your podcasts are part of that network? Yes. Yep. Real Estate. Tell us about those. One. Yeah. One is Real Estate 101 and the other is Millennial Investing. So Real Estate 101 is a show tailored towards newer investors, really helping, trying to help people get their first or next couple deals. So if you've done zero to five, 10 deals, you're probably still within our range. But if you're doing like big apartment buildings, probably not going to be super helpful for you. And then millennial investing is all about stock investing and personal finance. So those are kind of the two genres. And obviously millennial investing is tailored towards millennials and Gen Z. And then real estate is open to anybody, just typically zero to five or so deals. Yeah. So uh, tell us about your very first real estate investment. My very first real estate investment was an accident. I didn't go into it as an investment or really even thinking I could be a real estate investor. I purchased a house because my father told me that when I graduated college, started earning a salary that I was going to have to pay him rent. And good for him. Yeah. And, and I honestly, I thought that was reasonable. I didn't think it was, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Yeah. I totally probably would do the same thing if I was in his shoes. So I didn't blame him for it, but just being the person that I am, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have to pay him any rent. So, and he, he was very upfront with me about this. He told me my freshman year of college that that was going to be the case. So I said, you know what, I'm going to buy a house. My, when I graduate, as soon as I graduate, so I don't have to pay you any rent or anybody else. And so, you know, I was 18, everybody thought I was crazy. And I was the first one in my family to go to, go to college. So I'm not, I wasn't worried about doing things for the first time in my family. Ultimately, long story short, I ended up working as much as I could throughout college, getting educated, saving up as much money as I could. And I bought my first house, my senior year of, of college. And 
ultimately what happened was I lived there and it was just, like I said, just so I didn't have to pay my dad rent. And then I ended up renting out one of the bedrooms because I realized I hadn't uh, used it in a few months. So I said, well, I should probably just rent that out and see if I can make some money from it. And so ultimately I ended up renting it out for like 700 or $750 a month. And my all in cost was $1,100 a month. So I wasn't living for free or making money, but I was living for very cheap, three or $400 a month. And I didn't think anything of it. And then a few months later, I realized that this is a strategy called house hacking. And I had limiting beliefs about why I couldn't become a real estate investor. And ultimately, when I found out that that was actually a real estate investing strategy, took down all the limiting beliefs I had. And the rest is kind of history. What well, what were some of those limiting beliefs? Because I think that affects, certainly they affect me in different areas of my life. I just didn't think I had enough money. I mean, that was really the biggest thing. I never lacked confidence in my ability to learn or actually do it, but I just didn't think you had, I had enough money. Growing up, I always thought that real estate always seemed like something that was, you know, a millionaire or billionaires type game. So my plan was to invest in the stock market. That was my passion. I studied it for about eight years or so before I got into real estate. And I said, well, I'll make all my money and I'll make all my wealth in the stock market because there's low barriers to entry there and I understand it well. And then I'll take that money and I'll put it into real estate once I'm already rich. And so that was the biggest limiting belief I had. And then I learned that there were thousands and thousands of people doing exactly what I wanted to do that were no different than me. And so by seeing that, just knocked down all the limiting beliefs that I had. Mm -hmm. So folks listening are thinking, well, how in the world did a, did a, did a guy in college buy a house? Um, how much did you have to borrow to get this place? So the purchase price, this was a while ago now, so I'm not going to remember the numbers exactly, but it was somewhere around 140000 the house. And did you borrow most of that? Yes. Yep. I only put three and a half or five percent down. So, I mean, did you have a co-signer? I mean, you're in college. So how did you have enough income to qualify for the loan? No, I didn't have a co-signer. So what happened was my senior year of high school, I applied for a job as a bank teller. Hmm. And I literally started as a bank teller at the largest credit union where I live. And like two days after I graduated high school or like within a week after I graduated high school. And so one of the first things they do is they put you through a personal finance or like credit training for like a week. And so I was an 18 year old kid that learned pretty much everything I needed to know about personal finance, because they want you to know that you're handling all this money so that you don't, you're less likely to steal and, and commit fraud. So I was very thankful. That's probably one of the most impactful things that I've ever done in my life was having that job. And so going through that training was really, really helpful. I was just turned 18 a few months before. So I hadn't really had time to kind of like screw up my credit or anything like that. And so as soon as I went through that training, I got started and then I got my first credit card, did a couple other things credit related that, that were helpful. And so by the time I was 21, 22, when I was going to buy the house, I already had three or four years of good credit history. I had a very strong credit score. So from that perspective, I was, I was all set. And then Throughout my job at the bank, I really liked it. They gave, I was a part-timer, but they still gave me benefits. They did tuition reimbursement. They had 401k, et cetera. So I stayed there pretty much my whole time throughout college. And I worked my way up and I ultimately became a loan officer. And I was the one actually decisioning loans for our members. And so ultimately I ended up learning exactly what these loan officers were going to be looking for when I was going to get a mortgage. So I made sure that I did everything I needed to do to get myself lined. I knew in two to three, four years, I was going to want to buy a house. So I said, all right, I'm going to start now. And I'm going to start preparing myself so that I have everything in order for when that time comes. And so that worked. And ultimately, I worked at the bank roughly 25, 30 hours, between 20 and 30 hours a week, uh, all throughout college. And then that was enough. I mean, that was enough income to qualify for $140,000 house. So that's, that's the income came from, I saved as much money as I could from that job. I had the education. And so I just did, I, I put a lot of preparation into making sure I was in the right spot that I needed to be to get qualified. That is a wonderful story. And I hope that particularly parents listening to this that have kids in high school, they need to make sure these kids hear this uh, story because I, you know, there, I think there's a lot of positive things about working when you're in school, which I did too. Uh, but it never occurred to me to get a job at a bank uh, as a teller. And what great experience. Um, that, that's phenomenal. Do you, I'm curious, do you still own that property? 
I do not. So, okay. I, and I can tell you why, if, if you're interested. Yeah, sure. So, and yes, I, I completely agree about working at a bank or credit union. I would prefer, and I'd recommend you go to a credit union over <laughs> a bank, but yeah, that's probably been one of the well, most. Why, why is that? Uh, philosophy, things they care about. When you go to work at a bank, they're going to be really, really sales driven and not so much on the right per, uh, forms mm. of uh, financial education. Whereas with credit unions, they, I think they're just overall better institutions. And so therefore they treat their employees better. Typically, you know, this is broadly speaking, but every credit union I've heard of, they treat their employees really, really well and not overly salesy. They really always want to do the right thing, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah. and like I, that, that truly has been probably one of the most impactful things. Like if I ever become something super successful, I will always give credit to my father and working at the credit. And those are the two biggest things, but in terms of, of that, that property. So it was a, it was a condo. It was a two bedroom condo. And when I was purchasing it, there was this thing called the special assessment, which means that the HOA that manages the property basic didn't have enough money most likely to cover a special project that they wanted to do and so when i was buying it they didn't have all the details they didn't know exactly what the project was going to be they didn't know how much it was going to cost etc cetera, etc cetera. i took a gamble i said that's fine with me i'll still buy the property i bought the property and then ultimately what ended up happening was they did like a seven million dollar renovation to the entire like facility. So they wow. paved new pool siding on all the buildings. They gave us all new roofs. They redid all of our windows. They did all new sliding doors, a bunch of landscaping, et cetera. And they had $6 million in their HOA savings. So I was somebody that just moved into the property. And so basically to break it down on a per unit basis, they put about $60,000 or so into every unit. And the owners, they basically had about 45 to 50,000 in savings per unit. So that I basically got $60,000 worth of work done to my, my unit for maybe $10,000 my out of my own pocket, um, which was not actually paid in, in a lump sum. It could have been, but it was just added to the HOA. So long story short, the property value of all of the units went significantly up. And so I said, right now where I'm at, I need the capital more that I than I need the little bit of monthly cash flow because I knew I was going to move. So I said I could get a little bit of monthly cash flow here and make it a real rental, or I can just sell it, take the, the capital and put it into something else. And that seemed more uh that seemed like it was going to give me the most bang for my dog. With condos and HOAs, sometimes rentals can be a little bit of a, a hassle. So I just chose to sell it, take the money and mm. put it into another deal. So for folks that want to do house hacking, like you did, um, which may be a great way to, you know, get started, and this is a, maybe a technical question, but when you sold it, you know, as a resident, you wouldn't have gains on the first 250, assuming you were single, right? Yep. But as a real estate investment, you'd probably 1031 it into a new property, but, but you were kind of doing both, right? So how does that work with house hacking? When you sell it, did you get the $250,000 capital gains exclusion? Yep, because it's your primary residence. You have a primary yeah. mortgage on it. You've lived there for X amount of time. So yes. Yeah. Okay. So today, fast forward to today, what does your real estate empire look like? So today I have seven or eight units. I've done roughly 12 to 15 deals and I'm still house hacking today. I'm on my third house hack. So yeah. uh, that's pretty much what the portfolio looks like. Okay, that's great. And and do you manage all of these properties yourself? I do. I do. So they're all local to you? No, actually, most of them are in Texas. And I, I'm in. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm in the Boston area. Uh, so how do you how do you manage property that's in Texas? So the way that I manage properties in Texas is pretty much the same way that I manage my unit that's next door. So I own a duplex and. I house hack it. So I live in one unit, rent the other one. And so I manage the properties in Texas the same way that I manage that unit. If something breaks, this this is a business. I'm not doing this for fun. I'm not doing this is you get to treat real estate like a business. And so if the toilet next door breaks, even though I could literally walk over there and look at it, I'm not going to do that because one, I'm not a plumber. And two, I don't know what I'm looking at anyway. So what I'm going to do is call a plumber and have them go over and fix the toilet. 
And it's the same way for properties in Texas. They know we have a system in place where they need to submit a maintenance request or a software that we have. I'll get the request. And then whoever it needs to go to, if it's an electrician, plumber, handyman, whatever the case is, I send the request to the person that I know that can handle that issue. And then they go over there and they take care of it for me and send me the bill and I pay them electronically. And that's pretty much it. Well, that's okay. It sounds pretty straightforward. What um, I'm just curious, what software do you use? It is really pretty straightforward. I think people overthink it too much. And I think a lot of people are stuck in there. There is these stigmas, I think, around real estate that are, are decades and decades old. And I think technology has changed it a lot. Now, in terms of the platform, I was using a platform called Cozy for a while. It got acquired by apartments.com and I don't, I didn't love the the acquisition and how it changed the platform. So today I'm using a platform called Inago. It's I-N-N-A-G-O. I have no affiliation with them. I've only been using them for a few months, but it works really, really well for me so far. And so two questions about Texas. One, why Texas? And two, how do you find the properties you buy in Texas? So those are both really big questions. I think we could have podcasts, one whole podcast about each question, but I'll try to yeah. try to narrow it down. So basically what happened was I, I, my area is expensive. I'm just outside of Boston as a 22, three, four year old kid. I didn't have enough money to buy a rental up here. You needed roughly 80 to hundred grand typically to buy a rental up here where I live. And so I said, I'm not going to let that hold me back. So I've read a book on real, long distance real estate investing. Let's see if I could actually do this. And so my background is in finance and accounting. I love numbers, data, everything like that. And so I ended up meeting a gentleman named Neil Bawa. And he has this strategy where you look at these six demographic data points and the better they rank on all six, the better the city is typically for a rental. And so what I did was I paid a software developer to scrape census data for 7,000 cities across the US. And then I did some data analysis in Excel and ranked all 7,000 cities from one to 7,000. And ultimately I looked at the top 25 and I said, let's cross off any that either A, don't have any uh, inventory that I want. So if I'm looking for multifamily and they don't have multifamily, I'll cross it off. If they don't have any single family, I'm looking for single family, I'll cross that one off. So if there's no inventory off the list, and then if there's no real estate professionals, if there isn't a lot of handyman contract or any type of contractor, if there isn't a lot of really good rate, uh, real estate agents, property managers, et cetera, it's getting crossed off the list. So I crossed off about 15 of the top 25, ended up with 10. And I started to make offers across all of these cities. And I basically said, whichever one I get first is where I'll start to, to focus. And that's where I'll start to build. And so I had offers in Idaho, Texas, Florida, Alabama, Ohio, North Carolina, all over the country, all at the same time. And then ultimately I got my first deal in Texas. It went really, really well. And so I've continued to just invest in the same small town in Texas. And in terms of finding the deals, I have bought everything off the MLS. And that's, I think, a little bit unique to my strategy and in the way I, the reason, because when I went long distance, a lot of people, especially real estate investors ask me, why don't you just go where other people are already investing long distance, right? There's cities like Birmingham, Alabama, there's Indianapolis, Indiana, there's some in Tennessee, there's some in Ohio. There's tons of turnkey companies there and there's a lot of long distance investors buying there. Why don't you just do that? And so that's where I really leaned on my background of stock investing because in the stock investing world, you're trying to find opportunities that other people haven't found. And so I, I really leaned on that and said, why would I go where everybody else already is, where there's all this competition? What if I can find a city that has great demographic data points, looks like it's going to be a great rental city and invest there. Then I'll have, in theory, less competition. And ultimately, that's kind of what happened is there is still quite a bit of competition where I invest, mostly homeowners, but there are some investors too, just not as many as if you had gone to these traditionally focused, long distance focused cities. And so I'm able to get pretty good deals uh, right off the MLS. Hmm. And so for folks listening that think they're probably not going to hire a software developer and scrape data on 7,000 cities, any tips for them on finding places to, to start investing? Well, I would say anybody can do that. It cost me like 200 bucks. It was super easy. It was not like, it, it sounds probably more complex than it is. You just go on a freelance website and hire a developer that can do scraping. And um, yeah, it was like, 
maybe 150 to 250 dollars it was not a ton of ton of money um so you could do that you just shoot me an email i'll send you my whole spreadsheet for free um oh, there you go nice. and uh i think you're probably gonna get some emails yeah no problem i'll send, I'll send it right over uh, do you do you own your your properties through llc's I do not. So I started originally saying when I first got into investing, before I knew anything, I said that I was going to, I would only buy real estate in an LLC. And I went to try to do that with my first property. And that's where I ran into my first headaches was that I realized banks, pretty much no banks would lend. And so uh, for this type of property, for a four unit or less property. And so I realized that that wasn't going to work for me. And so I ended up buying it in my name, my personal name, and then just getting a, a umbrella. Yeah. Basically yeah. replicate yeah. the benefits of, of the LLC. Yeah, that's what I did. I don't own any investment properties now. I owned up to, I had five in Ohio, actually, Ohio, because that's where I'm from. And uh, my friend that, that was doing this with me, we just held it in our names. I think I would do LLCs today. I mean, some say, you know, you can buy it in your name and then switch it out. And then people get concerned about like the do on sale clause. Although what I've heard is that banks rarely, if ever, actually will come in and say, no, 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 your LLC can't hold it. But at the end of the day, you know, you want to protect yourself from liability. And I did the same thing. I had an umbrella policy. And um, uh, so, OK, uh, have you ever been to these? Do you own real estate you've never seen in person? Yeah, I've never seen any of those rentals. I've never even been to the city that they're in. That's, that's, is that, is that, uh, I mean, is that normal? I mean, for people that are investing long distance, I guess that's maybe typical. I don't know. It seems, it just seems odd to buy real estate that you've never actually seen. I don't, I don't think I'm, I don't think it's normal, but I think it should be. I think there are a lot of people who go long distance. I, I first off, I don't think there's a lot of people that go long distance. And then those that do, I think there's a, probably a good portion that do go see the properties. If these properties were more expensive or if I had a bigger portfolio than in that one area, I have four or five there, and then I would go see them. But I guess when I hear people say that, I always joke and say, if, if I have to go there, then something is seriously wrong. And there's no real added value of me being there because a lot of people will say, well, don't you want to see the property before you buy it? And my answer is not really because it, it I get no value from seeing it. I, I have no idea what I'm looking at anyway. I know nothing about construction. I know nothing about electrical plumbing. I have no clue what I'm looking at. So even when I bought my own, my own houses, like I barely go and look at them in terms of like the quality because I don't know what I'm looking at. So what I do is I hire somebody that knows what they're looking at, mostly through an inspection to tell me what they see. And then I rely on somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. And so it's the same way in Texas. I send somebody out there that knows what they're looking for and they just tell me what I need to know and that's it. So I just, I don't see there's being massive value in, yeah. in me being there for it. And I, I think I've always joked that when I get to like six or seven out in Texas, then I'll go because then it's kind of worth that I could see, you know, I'm not going to go just for one single family house, but if I could go see six or seven or eight of my properties while I'm out there, then, then I would. So we bought HUD foreclosures when I was investing. And so we had to rehab them. Um, did you have to do any rehab? And if you don't go to the properties, did you just pay someone to go in there and make recommendations on what they thought needed to be done? Yeah. So my last three, so the first couple, uh, first one or two were just turnkey pretty much. They were homeowners that were selling the property. They were in good shape. I bought them that way and then rented them out. And then the last three were all bird deals and they have all been... I wouldn't say significant rehabs, but they've had some, some decent rehabs in them. Mm -hmm. And so for me, and what I recommend people doing is finding yourself an absolute rock star real estate agent that is willing to help you with all this stuff. And so that's what I've done is my real estate agent is the best. He helps me with so much stuff. And so he is the one that kind of helped mm -hmm. me work through the rehabs. I mean, basically he would tell me he'd, He's my eyes there. He'd walk through everything. He's an investor himself. He does the same thing himself. So he knows what is going on. And so he said, this is what I would fix. This is what I would change, et cetera, et cetera. And we just worked it through him. Now, for somebody who can't find that type of agent, which I'd argue maybe you should go to a different market until you can find one. But nonetheless, if you're convinced on a certain market, you could pay somebody that can go and, and be there for 
the renovations can go and be there for, you know, walkthroughs with, with the, or uh, try to get some ideas as to what needs to be fixed. So you could definitely pay somebody to do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was investing, we had a rule of thumb where we, you know, this is in Ohio, central Ohio, where I'm from, uh, where we wanted to buy properties that we thought we could rent out for a monthly rent um, equal to 1% of our, our total all in investment, the purchase price plus the rehab. And in Ohio, at least when we were investing, which was, you know, I think we started in 05, uh, that was very easy to do. Now, in Northern Virginia, where I live and have lived for 30 years, there's a townhome around the corner that's actually being rented and it's for sale, you know, so it's an investment property. Uh, it, the cost is 600000 uh, which I think is reasonable. And the rent they're getting is $2,700. So, you know, it's not even close. So I guess my question is, do you have any rules of thumb that you apply to a property uh, that helps you decide whether it's, you know, a good investment? Yeah, so there's a couple of different things or layers to that. So when I'm just filtering, let's just say I have 50 properties I'm looking at. The 1% rule is a criteria that I use to kind of just quickly filter out uh, the majority of the properties. Let's just say there's a couple that are at or above 1%. Those will go into the analyze further pile. If there's some slightly below, but they're close, those will probably go into the analyze pile as well. If there's something that, like that, that's not even close, I, it goes into the don't even worry about it pile because there's very little chance that that's going to make any sense for what I need. So in terms of filtering out properties, that's the rule that I use as well. When it comes to actually analyzing, there's different benchmarks. The two that I focus on are what is the cash on cash return and what is my cash flow per door? And so that's going to be determinant for me of what I'm willing to buy. Mm -hmm. And so that property you mentioned is not going to work for me. I would probably never buy that property. But there are some people that it would work for and for various reasons, maybe they have smaller return requirements than I do. Maybe they're going to buy it in all cash, all cash. Now you're making what $2,700 a month and essentially profit. I mean, there's, you know, reserves there you need to take out and maintenance, et cetera. But generally speaking, maybe they, that's just what they want to do with their money. They believe in the market. They're going to pay cash for it. They'll get nice $2,700 a month. So there's various different strategies, various different ways that people go into it. And just because it doesn't work for you doesn't mean it won't work for somebody. I right. always try and keep that in mind. Now with the 1% rule, it is it is a good rule and I do use it, but it's not black and white. It depends on, so Texas and where I live in New Hampshire are very high property tax states. So that typically makes the 1% rule even a little bit harder to use. So there's different, there's different things that can impact the validity of the 1% rule. So you just kind of have to know how it works in your market. But generally speaking, I do rely on the 1% rule. Yeah. Yeah. I take it some of your properties, maybe all of them are multifamily. Uh, only one of them is multifamily. The rest are okay, all single. Okay. okay. So um, I'm curious with COVID and, you know, the inability to evict folks, which I think is, I don't, I'm not sure if it's still in place or if it's, but did you have tenants that stopped paying you? And how did you deal with that? Nope. Every single tenant I have paid a dollar, every dollar, every month. Wow. We haven't had a single person be late. Do you, I assume you have other friends or people, you know, that are real estate investors, you know, you probably have a network of people. Do you know other people that really investors or landlords, I guess, that really suffered because tenants stopped paying or was it not really, you just haven't seen it affect many, many people. The biggest I've seen it impact people people is I, I have a friend who is mostly student rentals. So they have uh, student rental properties near colleges or on college campuses. And so they were hurt uh, relatively bad because people were going to school for a while or were leaving campus, et cetera. So they were, they were hurting uh, quite a bit, but other than that, yeah. most people that I've spoken with have had pretty good luck. Yeah, I have a cousin who is uh, invests in real estate, has for years near a college, you know, a, a major university, and it's been a phenomenal business for him. Uh, although I've not talked to him about how COVID impacted him, I need to I need to do that. But um, well, let's let's switch a little bit um, and talk about stocks because you know that's your other podcast. Uh, can you just kind of give us an overview of your portfolio? Is it is it mainly index funds? Active managed funds, individual stocks. How do you think about that part of your, you know, your investments? 
yeah. So I, I say stock investing is my, was my first love and uh, real estate is my second, but today my portfolio is pretty split between crypto index funds and individual stocks. I don't buy any actively managed funds. Uh, so originally I was pretty much all individual pick stock picks. And now I've done roughly probably 40% index funds, 60% individual stock picks in crypto. If I had to kind of break it down. So crypto, let's talk about that. Is it mainly Bitcoin, Ethereum? What, or what kind of coins are you invested in? I'm personally only in Bitcoin. I'm sorry, only in what? Bitcoin. Okay. And how long have you been investing in Bitcoin? Uh, for years. I, I entered a position years ago and I haven't touched it since. So you have you ever sold a single Bitcoin? Yes. Well, yes and no. So years, like a, a while ago, when Bitcoin was really new, I was very, very, very bull, uh, bearish on Bitcoin. I didn't believe in it at all. I thought it was ridiculous. And so I bought a coin and I literally, because I'm a, a very much a Warren Buffett style investor. So when you don't understand what you're investing in or you're, it's not within your circle of competence, it can have an impact on you. And so for me, I bought a Bitcoin and I literally felt like almost sick to my stomach. I wasn't sleeping good at night. <laughs> I, I knew I didn't know what I was investing in. Like I knew this was not within my circle of competence. I knew I had no idea what I was doing. So I literally sold it like the next day or two days later. And this was back in like 2016, 2017. So this is a while ago. And then I got really educated. I understood it more. I realized what it's actually all about. And then I entered another position and I've never sold that position since. And are you buying more? Yeah, occasionally I do buy more. I, what I do is I take my credit card rewards and I put them into crypto or other small little like money that I get that way and put it into crypto. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty happy with my allocation for now. And, you know, I just, right now I have so many other things that are going on in terms of like real estate and stock investments and reinvesting in my business. And so the exercise that I go through is every dollar that I get, I say, what is the best thing I can do with this dollar? Mm -hmm. and I just have so many buckets that I can fill. Um, it's not that I'm not bullish on crypto because I am. I'm just, I have so many things. I got to decide what's best. So I'm a big Warren Buffett fan, value investor. I've been to, to Omaha. Um, and I don't invest in crypto, uh, even though I was writing about it when it was under a dollar a coin. So I certainly wish I would have just thrown 100 bucks in, right? But that's easy to do. I wish I would have started investing in Berkshire in 1979. Uh, so you can wish that all day long, right? And the reality is, had I invested in Bitcoin when it was a nickel, there's no way I would still own it today. I would have been thrilled to sell it at a dollar, right? Um, but you know, Warren might say, not that I should speak for Mr. Buffett, but he might say, look, it has no intrinsic value. There's no cash flow to it. it as a practical matter, unlike other commodities, because you could say, well, oil doesn't have any right intrinsic value, right? That's true. But it has day-to-day real-world uses. So does a bushel of corn or wheat, or even for that matter, gold to some extent. You know, about half of every half of all mine gold goes to actual practical uses, not to a vault somewhere. But Bitcoin, as a practical matter, is you know, it's functionally, it's useless. I know in theory, it could be a currency, but that's not how people are using it right now. It's not why it's trading above 60,000. Um, and so it has no intrinsic value. It has, as a practical matter, no use. So how do you go about valuing it and deciding whether it's a good time to buy and to sell? Uh, or is it just buy it and just hold it for a long time and see what happens? A little bit of all of it. So I agree that it, in theory, it doesn't really have any practicality, but I almost think that it does. And so gold, you know, it could be jewelry, it could be used in a bunch of other stuff, like you mentioned, but crypto, it has other things that make it practical. Maybe it's not going into jewelry, but it can be used as it's, you know, it's really private. It's really secure. It's really, um, and those are the types of like functionality. And, and I think of a digital currency like that. And also I'm, I'm cautious to call it even a currency because that's what I really got wrong when I entered that first position back in like 2016, 2017 was that I was like, there's no way that this is going to replace the dollar. There's no way that people are going to buy everything with crypto. It just makes no sense. I don't get it. And then I realized that it's not necessarily, and what I got wrong and what I think a lot of early people got wrong who were bearish was that it's not meant to replace the dollar per se. 
it's more similar to gold. And so what a lot of real gurus in Bitcoin will say is the dollar is going to exist. That's going to be our transactional currency. You're going to continue to buy things in a dollar or maybe a new digital currency that replicates a dollar. And Bitcoin is going to be its own thing, similar to gold or any other precious metal thing. Mm. Yeah. So that when my flaw, when I heard that my philosophy changed, my total, my understanding completely changed. And so mm-hmm. that was one thing. And the second thing was by no means am I a Bitcoin expert. I know a little bit, I know enough to be dangerous, but I am not an expert by any means. But what happened was there is a gentleman named Preston Pish, who you may be familiar with Rob, but mm-hmm. people listening may not. He was probably one of the most strict Warren Buffett value investor followers that I've ever met. And he became very bullish on Bitcoin. And it was very interesting to me because Preston is brilliant. He's very, very smart, well-educated. He's very uh, regimented. He's very, you know, he lives a really principled life and he knows, and he really thinks things through. He's he's not not somebody that really gets caught up in hype or uh, a trend. So when I saw somebody that was so disciplined as a value investor, and had studied Buffett, written some of the best-selling books about Buffett, decades of of value investing, really get bullish on Bitcoin. I said, well, that's interesting to me because I'm interested in these influencers or these other people who are just getting in because it's trendy and had no idea how, you know, economics and things work. But when somebody like that got interested, it, it really piqued my interest. And so for me, the way I approach it is that I would rather have a little bit of skin in the game because think i'll be happier that i participated uh, and then i'll be more mad than if i lose that money so i asked Mm -hmm. myself that i said if i put this money in and i lose it will that bother me more or will it bother me more that i didn't put the money in and i didn't participate in this at all and so for me it's more important to get a little bit of participation than it is to worry about losing that money well that's an interesting perspective and i think it underscores how important it is to understand ourselves when it comes to investing um, yeah, I'm very familiar. I, I don't know him personally, but I'm very familiar with Preston and I know his views on, on Bitcoin and crypto. And I do have to give a lot of credit to the people like Preston who saw, I think, long before m- most people where this was going to go. Uh, the, the tricky thing, though, is uh, and I, I worry about those people that have become fabulously wealthy. I, don't know, I wouldn't say I worry about them. What's to worry? But that become fabulously wealthy, but still hold on to all of their Bitcoin. Uh, and that was the problem I had. If I hold it, let's say it goes to 100. Now what do I do? I mean, do I do I just plan to hold it forever? I mean, I you know, I, and some would say, well, Rob, you're going to sell your Berkshire stock. Well, no, I do plan to hold it forever, but it's it's producing cash flow, not that it ever gets paid out into a dividend. But in any event, uh, that's my been my struggle. Um, I know we're, we're we're running short on time, but in terms of your stock portfolio, can you just give us an idea of like? How many different positions do you have? And um, just maybe how you go about picking um, a company to invest in. With In terms of holding crypto forever, there is products where you can get cash out uh, against mm-hmm. your crypto as the collateral. So it's similar to like a cash out refinance on real estate. So if you want to hold it forever, there is ways to get liquidity uh, if need be. Like now, staking like- and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, or you can even just do like a collateralized loan. There's some oh, product that'll put up yeah, your sure. as, as collateral. Yeah. So in terms of my stock portfolio, I think one of the things that makes me a relatively decent investor is that I don't look at my portfolio. So I can't tell you exactly there's nine picks in my portfolio right now because mm-hmm. I haven't looked at it in probably months. And so, but last time I checked, I think I roughly had probably 15 positions total in terms of individual stocks and also index funds. But I believe the top five picks of my portfolio for individual stocks makes up like 80% or 90% of my individual pick percentage. So of the 60%, five picks make up 90% of that. So it's relatively, I run a relatively concentrated portfolio. I'm very confident in what I've picked. I've not really... I'm very, I'm not very risk adverse. I'm very uh, risk seeking. So I'm, I'm happy to run a concentrated portfolio. And I typically, again, going back to Buffett, Buffett has a, a philosophy that uh, diversification is for people who don't know what they're doing. 
And uh, I, I definitely don't know all, but I like to think I know a little bit. And so I'm confident in myself and, and I'm happy to run a concentrated portfolio. So uh, my index funds are pretty much exclusively VOO, which is S&P 500. And then individual stock picks range from a bunch of different companies. What well, can you recall the last or one of the last stocks you bought? I can't remember the last one I purchased, but the biggest position in my portfolio is Square. I've owned Square oh. since like the 30s or 40s range, and I've owned it for years. And so I made a big bet, uh, not not necessarily because of crypto, but just because of, again, kind of working in the credit union and banking industry mm-hmm. and just kind of seeing trends. I saw people moving away from cash and more to these cashless payment systems. So my biggest positions are Square, PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa. And so those make up a big, big percentage of my portfolio. Do you think um, for someone like me that may not want to buy Bitcoin, do you think a a stock like Square might be the kind of investment that might give me some indirect exposure? I know there's like micro strategy if you're familiar with them, but I just can't stomach their CEO. (laughs) So I just would never, you know, but in any event, that's a whole other podcast. Um, So can you get sort of indirect exposure to crypto through through an investment in either say something like PayPal or Square? Yeah, absolutely. So again, not investing advice, not saying to run out and buy Square or sure, PayPal, but, sure. but yes, it is a way to, you know, fundamentally, it is a way to get indirect access to crypto. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, Robert, I appreciate your time. Um, this has been great. Um, where uh, Anything I've missed that you want to share and where can folks find you? Where should they reach out to you? No, I think we touched on a, a lot of really good stuff. I mean, there's infinite things we could talk about. There's so many yeah. rabbit holes we could go down, but I think we covered a lot of really good stuff. Uh, the best place to find me and, and connect with me personally, if you're interested, is social media. So Twitter and Instagram are my main focuses. My username on both is the same. It's the Robert Leonard. And if you want to just learn more about these types of topics, hear some more stories, uh, you can check out the podcast. Those are Millennial Investing and Real Estate 101. Yeah, and, and one other thing I want to give a shout out to is Shadow Invest Investor or Investing. I don't know if I've got it right, but that's where folks can shadow a real estate investor. Is that right? Yeah, so that's called InvestorShadow.com. So that's something that I started. A lot of people uh, pay to follow stock investors and look at their stock picks and things like yeah. that. And I said, I haven't seen anything like that in the real estate world. Why don't we create it? And so that's another thing that I'm, I'm working on. That's an investor shadow.com. Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. Good. All right, Robert. Well, thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me.